Amen. Man, we've been looking at 1 Peter. Last week, we were able to complete chapter 3. We had stayed in one section there at the end of chapter 3 for 10 different weeks. Very important passage. Vital passage. A passage that the disciples, the early Christians, understood and knew and appreciated. Information that you and I have lost thanks to the Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages when they sent the knights and everybody through the entire world gathering all the truth of Christian sayings, Christian writings, Christian truth that had been passed down and they wanted to change the story. And they have changed the story and they've gotten rid of the truth. They have called fiction truth and truth fiction. The Pope this week said that Mary is the gate to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. That's Jesus. That's a fine pinch point. And many people just salivate at whenever he's by uh, and believe everything he says. And he is a liar. He is a wolf. And he is the false prophet in the book of Revelation that Jesus will throw alive into hell. He's going to kill him, raise him up, and throw him alive. I love that part. He's going to come and do that to Obama too. He's going to kill them, raise them up, and throw them alive into hell. Once you follow these guys, you better get to know who God is. You better get to know his game plan and follow along with it, man, and just do what he's calling you to do. And then last week, we also looked at the importance of uh, Noah. God told Noah to build a boat we have no inkling that Noah was even a woodworker, knew how to work with pitch, knew how to work with nails, knew how to work with dowel rods. We, we have no idea that. He just, God told him to do something, and he stepped out in, in a new era in his life. Ship making. Sometimes God's going to come along to you and call you unto something new that you are very unfamiliar with, but if God calls you, he will provide. He will direct you. He will give you everything, all the tools necessary to make that come about because God will not call you something to do something you cannot do and he will empower you to do it and he stretches us and he calls us under new things and he called Noah to build a boat and Noah was faithful Noah had never seen rain Noah had never known a flood but what he did know was God and when God said to do something he said okay then I don't know what the flood is I don't know what rain is I don't know what destruction is I don't know what, what, that, what that means but build a boat huh and he went and built a boat. Guys, sometimes God's going to call you to do things and sit you in situations that you don't understand. Instead of questioning God, why are you doing this to me? You praise him and say, I'm thankful, man. I'm glad you're a chess player and you're way ahead. You're ten, ten moves ahead. And I love it. I love the fact that you're about to take Satan's kingdom out. Now, he already did spiritually. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus rose from the dead, the satanic spirit world was rendered dead. Paralyzed. Except in one area. The mind of men. Belief. Jesus reacts in faith to belief. He loves belief. That's why that belief is a big word. It's more than just uh, believing in the facts. It is jumping in by your life. Your life. You really believe this. You really believe that if you don't have a roof on your head, your, your house will be tr in trouble. Because the rain will come. It may be sunny today, but if you don't have a roof on your head, the hail might get to you. So you, in faith, when you build a house, even on sunny days, you put a roof over that thing. And we, we look ahead, we build ahead to what is coming. And by, we do that by belief, by faith. And God has called us to a life of faith, to believing what he said and living it out, making it who we are. Whatever this book right here says is what I am. Guys, if you're not reading the Bible, you're in trouble, man. You're in trouble. We encourage you. And, and what's cool about God, it's never too late, man. Okay, I still got some breath. Today's the day. Now's the accepted time. Today's the day of salvation. Pick that Bible up and know it. Read it. Let it become who you are. Believe by your life. Believe by your life. God reacts so well and positively and stunned at belief and faith. The devil's kingdom is only empowered by your faith. Because what happened? What did God give us? He breathed into us, our nostrils, the breath of life, and we became a living soul. And now we have spiritual energy, not like the New Age talks about, but the New Age knows about it. And they have changed the definitions, and, but they utilize it for their own sake. The energy that you have, you're made of electricity. 
Your heart beats by way of electricity. Oh, you live on an electromagnetic world. This whole place is electricity. There is power there. And I can take all that power, glory, love, honor, praise, thoughts, everything, and give it Godward or not. And if it doesn't go Godward, it is going to Satan. Because Satan is the God of this world. Now, God is God over all. But it appears that God is not the God of this world because right now there's something called the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven will be, take place in about now 19 years. When Jesus Christ comes back after he has cleaned this place up and melted it with perfect heat and killed all the bad people, destroyed everybody who's got the mark of the beast, killed all the Nephilim, all the demons, sent them straight to hell, all the world leaders who chose to follow the beast, he's going to get rid of all that, and the only thing that will be left are the war out believers who survived it all. And they're going to see their king, whom they pierce, and they're going to love him, and they're going to be so thankful, and they're going to be heard, said, well done good and faithful servants. You've been faithful over a few things in this past seven years. I'm going to make you ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom where Jesus Christ sets up his throne and physically reigns a physical kingdom for 1,000 years. Right now, you and I spiritually live in the kingdom of God. It is a spiritual kingdom, and only those who have made God, Jesus Christ, king, Does he reign in? Is Jesus Christ your king? There is a throne in your soul, in your heart. You are sitting on it. Satan is sitting on it. Some idol that you worship is sitting on it, or Jesus Christ is sitting on it. Who is sitting on the throne of your heart right now? Who governs your thoughts? Who governs your life? Who is your king? To whom do you do your obeisance and servitude? Who do you serve? Hey, by life we say we serve Jesus. We give all of our life to Jesus. When we got saved, I, I wanted to go to heaven. I didn't want to go to hell. That was a big emphasis in my being saved. I had heard about the coming judgment, and I did not want to go to hell. So I heard that Jesus is the only way, and I got saved. Since then, I've learned who he is, and there's a whole lot, of, a whole lot more that comes along with that. There's friendship. There's joy. There's, there's wonderment. There's... The future, what the Bible says about our futures, and that's what we're looking at today. Everything you do now determines your entire eternity. Every bit of it. Satan wants you missing out on what God intended for you to have. He's not my king. I don't want anything he says and declares. He is a paralytic. He's paralyzed. All he has is a mouth. All he does is harp and yell and scream and threat and roar like a lion, but he can't move unless you empower him to move with your belief. That's the only way he works. Because he works according to the law of God. And right now, you and I are living in the kingdom of God. Is Jesus Christ the king of your heart? Is the absolute king of your heart? Are you saved? That's where it starts. Then he says, if you truly are saved, you've been born again, you've believed in my death, burial, and resurrection, you've believed that you've embraced that for yourself. Yes, you did this for me, and I'm so thankful you are saved. Then it says, he begins a work in you, and he who starts the work in you will be faithful to complete the work in you. And his whole purpose is to develop fruit in your life. Obedience. And he says, and by the time of judgment day comes, some of you will have been 30 folders. Some of you, and this is, just, this is the same. This is the church of Philadelphia. Some of you will have been 30 folders. Some of you will have been 60 folders. You know, one, two thirds. And some of you will be 100 folders. You will have given every bit, every portion, every word, every thought unto the obedience of Christ. You will have yielded every bit of yourself to him. Why don't we determine we're going to do that? We're going to face him. Do you really believe that you're going to face him? You did the day you got saved because you didn't want to go to hell. Now you really believe you're going to face him. Why don't you set out and say, Papa, please help me to, to be able to make you king. I want you to be king. I, I knight you king. I declare you king. I elevate you as king. I lift you up as king. I want you to be the king of me. 
the king of my heart, the king of my life. Now, you can't control anybody else in your family. You can't control your kids. Now, we can control them as parents, but I can't make them believe in God. I can encourage them to believe in God. I can't control my spouse. I can encourage them, love them, nurture them, and everything. But every man must choose on his own volition and will, and every man and woman, individual, will give an account of themselves for the things they've done in the body, and did they, did you, make Jesus the king of your heart? And I encourage you to do that. Right now we're in the kingdom of God, and that's why it looks like the kingdom of Satan is over, over ruling, overwhelming us, taking over more darker and darker every day because the true believers are very minuscule. There's very few of us. And then when God calls us out by way of the rapture, the true believers, it's going to get dark, dark, pure dark. And then all of a sudden, people, after the rapture, are going to wake up and they're going to realize, oh, there was a rapture. And they're going to hear the two witnesses preaching. They're going to hear the 144,000 preachers witnessing. And they're going to say, oh, no, we, we missed the rapture. But we do believe. And they're going to be, be believing during that seven-year tribulation period. Halfway into that tribulation period, three and a half years in, 42 months, 1,260 days in, Obama is going to walk into the temple, declare himself to be God, and then start demanding everybody get a chip implant in their hand. So he can track you. And it also has a DNA factor in it that will change your DNA at a third helix. It is demon seed mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. He wants to turn you into a non-human. Because Jesus only saves humans, 100% human beings. That's all that can be saved. And Satan is wanting to keep you from salvation. And when you get that seed, it adds another helix to your body. You become non-human and therefore unredeemable. And that's why the Bible warns in the book of Revelation, whoever gets the mark cannot be, will not be saved ever. So the warning goes out. These preachers will be preaching that and many will believe. And they're going to be on the fly. They're going to be on the run. It was just like this 2,000 years ago in early Palestine. Paul, Peter wrote this about 30 years after Jesus ascended to heaven. Okay, After the day of Pentecost, this is about 30 years later, he writes this, and they are under some great turmoil. you got the Caesars in Rome who are outlawing Christianity and destroying the Christians. And these people find themselves being tortured, being in small places, and Peter writes this passage. And now, before we get to today's passage, I want you to understand that last week's passage ended with Noah and his belief and that which Noah believed in brought him salvation and that which everybody else rejected, the same thing, the same flood, the same water that lifted him up destroyed all the rest. God's truth is either going to bless you or curse you. It depends what you do with it. Will you obey him today? Then he talked about baptism. Guys, baptism is identifying yourself with God. And we do it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Salvation is God identifying himself with me. When Jesus was baptized, he identified himself with us. When we get baptized, we identify ourselves with him, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we are saying, yes, I willingly obey. I willingly allow him to place his mark on me, his, his tag of identity, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Yes, I wholeheartedly follow this in submission, in immersion, submersion, death, all the way unto his new life. And I now let him live his life in me through resurrected power because I have died unto myself. That's what baptism is saying. Baptism is your first message that you ever preach without saying a word. You're walking in obedience and you say, I'm identifying myself in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That portion doesn't save you. That portion identifies you as one who's been saved. You're identifying yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And baptism, if you've not been baptized, is extremely important. It does not save you. And we talked about that. It's not the washing of the filth off your flesh. A lot of people have gotten baptized who are going to hell. But only those who are saved have been baptized in the belief, the blood of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit in belief, are the ones who are going to heaven. And those people who've truly been born again, who've truly been baptized in the truth of salvation through Jesus Christ, will make a public profession of their baptism. And I encourage you to do that, identifying yourself with the Lord Jesus. Then we come here to a, a ratty little bud. He, Peter is writing from Babylon. He's writing to a group up in Turkey, the churches up in Turkey. Remember the seven churches in Revelation? That area is who he's writing to. Uh, Turkey doesn't have too many churches right now. Erdogan, their leader, is wanting to kill all Christians and all Jews, and he's doing one to destroy and set up his caliphate. He thinks he's the caliphate leader. So they say on their outward story, 
I think they actually believe that Obama is the caliphate leader and they are just the generals doing his bidding and they are ad identifying themselves as world leaders. Because the Bible says ten kingdoms are going to give themselves over to this man. Three will be uprooted and seven will remain. He's going to quickly squelch the three who rebel against him and then the seven will remain. Uh, kind of neat that G7 is meeting right now in France, a red, white, and blue country. France is the country by which we built our country, their philosophy of freedom. We have, in our United States of America, accepted the French version of Freemasonry. That's what we follow. It was the French who gave us Lady Liberty in New York Harbor. They are one of the seven members in France today. France, Italy, Great Britain, us, Japan, Germany, and whoever else. All around that area, boom. All protecting Switzerland. Satan's hometown. Jerusalem belongs to Jesus. Switzerland belongs to Satan. The monies of the world. And they all are protecting around that place. The neutral country. They are the defense of it. Watch. Keep your heads up. And so Peter's dealing with, with these people who are wanting to kill all the Christians. And he says, therefore, for as much as... as we talk about the flood and the baptism of Jesus Christ in verse 18 of chapter 3. We saw that he suffered one time, and then we saw this 10 times. We read this verse 10 times in the last 10 weeks. And he suffered once, and then while he was dead, it appeared dead, God had a mission for his spirit. And for three days he, speak, he spoke to the, and preached to the spirits in their prisons. And I'm thinking he spoke to all three uh, holding cells okay, that the Bible mentions to us. And then just like Jesus Christ suffered in his flesh, arm yourselves in the same way, likewise, with the same mind. Guys, don't you dare think you're going to be a Christian and not have suffering. If you're going to be a true Christian, you will have suffering. It's going to come your way. And you need to be prepared. And that's what true Christianity is. Suffering from the outside and suffering internally. It's going to come on you. There will be attack. You be ready and have yourself armed for it. When we send our boys off, 18 years old, now our girls off to boot camp, man, they train them in weaponry. They train them in command. They train them in crawling with their weapons. They teach them to do everything with their weapon. Their weapon is their buddy. They have to learn to take it apart in the dark blindfolded, put it back together. Their weapon is their friend. Their weapon is everything. It's all about being armed. Imagine them going all the way through boot camp, hearing the preaching, hearing the sergeant get up and preach the gospel of what they need to do to survive the warfare. And then they go to war. Don't take your gun. Forget your gun. Forgot my gun. I'm sorry about that. I'm, we're going to take this hill. Okay. Let's take this hill. Okay. Well, they tell all the game plan. They brief them and debrief them, and they get ready. Okay, here we're going. We're going to take this hill. And they all run up top of the hill, and they ain't got no weapons, and they're facing the enemy. The enemy, boom, trains on them, man, and they're like, oh, wait a second. I don't have my weapon. Let us go. We're going to go back and get our weapons real quick so we can come and have a fair fight. I mean, imagine the absurdity of that story, and that's what Christians end up doing. We preach and we warn and we scream like a sergeant. You're about to get into warfare, man. You're about to suffer, man. You're about to do this. You need your weapons. You need to take on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You must do this. You've got to do this. People find themselves right in the middle of, of Satan's schemes without their armor on. Without their weapon in hand. Without the word of God in their hearts, in their mouths. And guys, it's foolish for an American soldier to do that, try to take a hill without a weapon, and it is more foolish for you who say that Jesus Christ is the king of your heart, the king of your life, and you not to walk out there with the weapons that he has trained you with in boot camp, which is church service, which is your private Bible study, which is you reading the scripture. He's telling you what to do. Do it! By life, believing what he said. For as much then as Christ Jesus has suffered for us in his flesh, Arm yourselves, therefore, with the same mind. Arm yourself. Arm yourself. Arm yourself with what? The readiness of I'm about to suffer here. If I'm going to follow him, if I'm truly following Jesus, I'm going to suffer for Jesus. You better get that in your mind. You better arm yourself with that. You better train yourself with that. And you better prepare for when it happens. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, here's the deal. This is a very incredible doctrine. There's a whole lot of Christians who aren't suffering. 
there's a whole lot of Christians who are sinning. Who are out there sinning and making excuses for their sin and using Bible verses sometimes to cover up for their sinfulness. There's Christians right now, quote-unquote Christians, in Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches who are living there as an adulterous couple, a fornicating couple. There are people in church right now who are alcoholics and don't have a problem with it. They were blitzed off their tails last night. They drank in excess farther than they should have gone because the Bible says stay away from excesses of any kind. He should be our excess. He should be our overflow. He should, we should be filled and overfilled with him. He fills our cup, over, our cup runneth over with joy, not booze, or not pills, not anything else. Our cup runs over with joy. What does that mean? I've been in his presence. In the presence of God is the fullness, the overrunning, the overflowing of joy. I need to get off on God. I need him to be my friend and understand what happens when I do this. I need to arm myself with the truth. Guys, it sounds stupid. It sounds stupid. But you got to get rid of everything in this world and God will take care of everything when you dwell in his presence. He will supply your need. He will supply your joy. He will supply your emptiness. He will supply your boredom. He, he, he will, where your boredom was, he'll fill it with fullness. He'll do it. It sounds dumb. And most Christians think it's dumb because they continue in the life that they were living just before they got saved. But it's not dumb. It's the Bible, and we the preachers, we the boot camp instructors, the DIs are screaming out, arm yourself, get ready with this truth. Just the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, let it be in you. What was that same mind? Servitude, suffering. We're told in Genesis, we're told in Psalms, we're told in Isaiah. We're told that he would be a suffering servant. Zechariah, lowly, riding on a donkey. That, that's opposite of everything that a Messiah in the Jews' mind is. They had the second coming Jesus in mind, not the first coming Jesus, and you and I are to live according to the first coming Jesus. He will exalt us and make us like the second coming Jesus when he arrives. In the meantime, we are to be humble servants who are willing to suffer, knowing that we will suffer. And the choice is this, sin or suffering. When the trouble comes, issues come, and you're challenged with sin, even at work, the boss wants you to do something that's kind of under the table, kind of wrong. You know it's against God and against your conscience. But instead of wanting to look stupid, you go along with it. You've sinned and there will be no suffering in it. Jesus, through Paul, Peter here, Paul too, Paul, Paul's gospel talks this about suffering for Christ. He was a wonderful example of this. Peter was a great example. All the disciples were great examples of suffering. They all died at the hands of their captors. They were all martyrs except John. They attempted to murder him and he survived it and then God took him out to the Isle of Patmos all by himself while he was suffering alone. God came to him with the revelation and revealed to him the things of the apocalypse, the unveiling of what God's about, what Jesus is all about. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in his flesh, arm yourselves like Isaac with that same mind. And that mind is servitude, humility. It is suffering. That is the mind. Is this your mindset today? Because you, if you suffer, you've chosen not to live in sin. You say, I, I hate sin. I don't want nothing to do with sin because sin only brings me down and weighs me and it'll come and haunt you later. And you know that. How many of you understand the fact that your sin in the past can haunt you in the present? Anybody understand that? And Satan wants you to forget that and keep living in the sin because it's going to come back. He will always repay. Satan always repays. He's a double crosser. He says, come do this, come do this, and bam, kicks you while you're down for doing it. That's how he rolls. Jesus Christ has called us and says, why don't you step out of your sin, be willing to suffer for me, man. And suffering, it is sounds stupid, it's Bible doctrine, will bring you the greatest joy on planet Earth when you lay your head down at night knowing that you overcame, knowing that you were faithful to the Lord, knowing that you said no to sin, and knowing that that is going to reap you a great reward and position in heaven eternally. The choices we make now, there is a general inheritance for all believers. Just because you're saved, you will receive magnanimous, wonderful, awesome inheritance in heaven. But then those people who were faithful, 30, the 60, the 100s, are going to receive different kinds of blessings on greater levels. The greater servant you are here, the greater God elevates you there. The more humility you allow yourself to partake in and you immerse yourself in, the greater the glory you will receive in heaven. God shares with us, guys, his divinity. I am not divine. I am wicked. I am a wicked man. There's nothing godlike in me. 
But when I get saved, he plugs me in, and now something amazing can happen that can never happen before. His spirit, his character, the things that, about God flow through me, and now I can act godly. I don't have to put on an act. It flows through me because I am abiding in Christ. He is the root system. I am the vine. You are the branches. Everybody that abides in me will bear fruit. And God wants fruit. He wants more fruit. He wants much fruit. Are you bearing fruit? Are you abiding? Is he your God? Is he your king on the heart, uh, on your thro the throne of your heart? Is he there? Are you living your life by faith? Are you saying no to sin, knowing the repercussions of it? Are you saying no to sin, knowing that every time you sin willfully, you re-crucify Christ afresh, putting him in open shame? Every time you sin, you say, give me that nail, give me that hammer, and you nail Jesus on the cross every time you sin willfully. And those that have chosen suffering over sin understand that doctrine. Understand that I don't want to hurt my Jesus and I don't want to hurt my future because we don't live for immediate gratification now. What can I get out of it? Well, what's in it for me? I, I, I want to satisfy my lust. I, I'm right now. God's not about right now. God's right about He's all about endurance and long-suffering. He admires endurance and long-suffering in humanity more than any other characteristic because most people aren't patient. Most people aren't kind. Most people won't endure to the end. Most people quit and give up. Most people won't even go to boot camp to figure out what kind of weapons they need to take to war. Very few will. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, and few there be that get and understand what I'm preaching and teaching. You nod your head, you nod, nod the head of your heart, say yes, 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 believe, 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 and you're setting out to do this. Now, none of us are perfect. We all blow it, but we don't set out to sin. Right now, sitting in our seat, we say, I have no desire to sin. I don't want to go out and sin. I don't want to hurt the heart. A heart of the Lord, and I surely don't want to hurt me and my future, because I know this will, because the Bible teaches that it will. I won't go to hell if I'm saved for sinning. I'll just miss out on great blessing and inheritance if I do that. That is foolish. Why give up something momentarily? I can enjoy this momentarily and give up an entire eternity of blessing, of reward, of positionship. I don't understand what that means. I just know that I am here to scream at you and tell you to arm yourself with the mind of God and you are to duplicate who Jesus was while he was on this planet if you're a follower of his. You are to do it like he did and you'll do it willfully, you'll do it joyfully and you'll know, you'll know the blessing that comes along with that. The Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him in the future endured the cross, hating every bit of it, despising the shame that came along with it, despising the fact that he became your sin, despising the fact that the Father turned on him. But he did that for the joy that was set before him, the future, the eternal, eternal, eternal future. He gave up now momentarily for an eternal existence. Are you willing to do that? You better arm yourself with this thinking. You better arm yourself with the mind of Christ. You better arm yourself that you are going to choose suffering. Moses chose suffering over the pleasures of sin for a season. That's why he ran out to the wilderness. He said, I I'm the king's kid, and I I'm not going to stay in this wicked palace. I'll go out in the back 40 somewhere with a bunch of sheep, where God got a hold of him. God will get a hold of you when you say no to sin. God will get a hold of you. He'll talk to you. You'll find his presence. You'll find a burning bush. You'll have his voice speak to you. You'll find yourself on holy ground when you say no to the palace, and you say yes to the desert. Suffering, suffering, suffering. And he who, and you can tell the Christians, they're the ones who take a beating. You can tell the hundredfolders, they're the ones who take a beat, they, they take a beat down, beat down, and they praise the Lord for it. They suffer, they, they take a bad hit, they, they have a bad moment, they have bad notions, they have terrible things happen to them, and they praise the Lord in it, knowing that all things work together for good. And they come back with Bible verses, they come back with belief in the Lord, they come back with endurance, they come back with answers for Him. And you can tell those who don't. They're the ones who don't have a Bible verse stuck in their head. They don't know anything, and they'll sin as fast as they can. They'll look both ways and sneak a cookie. They'll do whatever they got to do to sin, 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 sin. And God's called us to the place, have this mind in you, that you'd rather suffer than sin even when nobody else is around because it's your Lord at stake here. You love him. You know what he's done for you. Verse 2. That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's what we've been preaching. I am willing to suffer because I am not wanting what this world offers. 
This world offers you nothing. How many of your buddies pay your bills for you? Your sinful buddies. How, how many of your, your guys that are just good old guys and they don't care nothing about God? How many of them take care of you and take care of your family? How many of them come running to see you when you're in the hospital? It's just a vain world out there, folks. Get your mind set. Have the mind of Jesus Christ, which is the truth. Focus on the truth here with reality. The real reality. No longer we choose suffering over fun and over sin and over pizzazz that we should live the rest of our time in this in the flesh, in, the, in this life, not unto the lust of men and the desires of men, but to the will of God. Lord, what is it you'll have me do? Guys, you're going to be dead at 79. That's the average death of the worldwide individual. Auto wreck, take you out. You breathe the air in the United States, you'll be dead at 59. You eat the food here, you brush your teeth with fluoride, you'll be dead soon. You're going to be dead soon. We have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Your life is a labor. It appears for a short time and then vanishes away. Prepare your heart now. Be ready now. Do not live after the lust of men. Live after the will of God. Because you know in your heart. You know it. You know that it will be well worth it. Now we come to the decision. Am I a wimp? Am I a wussy? Am I, do I have no backbone in my decision? If you don't, guys, pray for one. God took nothing and made backbones out of dirt. He took nothing and made dirt. Then he took dirt and made backbones. He can give you a backbone. Just pray for one. You have not because you ask not. Say, Lord God, give me the willingness to do your will and not go, keep going after my fleshly stupid desires. Verse 3. For in time past of our life, and you know, in your own past, you know your stupid decisions. It sufficed us to do everything what all our buddies around us were doing in the world of the Gentiles. You did what they did. You drank what they drank. You said what they said. You talked what they saw. You, you, you looked at what they looked at. David said, I was setting a wicked thing before my eyes. Christians got that sitting in their living room, in their children's room. It's a television, a phone. They have access to any wicked thing they can find. Oh, but we got their phone blocked. They got buddies, right? We got friends. Okay. Don't, don't be stupid to me, parent. Don't be stupid to yourself, parent. Okay. Don't be a re-re here. Okay? These kids are seeing things that they shouldn't see, and you should not allow this stuff into your home. And Christians just welcome it in their home because they got to be entertained because they're living for right now. I don't know how to exist if I can't watch the next four hours of TV. What would I do? What on earth would I do if I couldn't watch the next four hours of TV? And you, you consider the last four hours of TV that you watched. And how much of that brought glory to God? How much of that got you eternal riches in heaven? How much of that is going to come back and attaboy you forever? Or the opposite. How much of that is destructive? How much of that is against God? How much of that re-crucified Christ afresh? God hates cursing. He hates demons. He hates Nephilim. He hates fornication. You saw that on the last four hours of TV. All that. He hates idol worship. He hates it when he doesn't receive the glory. The Father does. The Father hates it when you don't give God, Jesus Christ, the glory. He did all that on Calvary for you, and you don't give him the glory. You're going to give some superhero the glory instead? You're going to, you're going to give some advertiser the glory? You're going to give your new car the glory? You're going to give your new house the glory? Everything's, oh, instead of Jesus, oh, mighty, holy, forever and ever versus the temporary? You are a fool. In the times past, it suffices us to, to, to do whatever the, everybody around us was doing here in Gentileville, Wickedville, Lost Sinnerville. When we walk in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wines, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries. That list right there is three excesses. Food, wine, and sex. Food Network is so benign. How much time do you spend in Food Network versus the Scriptures? How much time? Food, guys, as soon as you eat food, it'll be in the draft. It'll be in the toilet in 17 hours. It's over with. It's that temporary. I want you to imagine that versus the eternal. What you put in spiritually, the word of God, the life of God. Let his life be in you. And we focus on the temporary. We focus on the travel channel. We focus on all these places that are going to be burned up that God hates. You guys understand that God hates this earth. He hates it. The only reason he hasn't destroyed it yet is because he has a plan. He wants you saved. But his time clock's about to run out. 6,000 years about to get here. 
and then he's going to start his thing, and it's going to be destructive. And he's going to send demon Nephilim along to destroy you and chew your face off. He's going to do that. He's going to send 200 million demon scorpions here with breastplates of steel and the list goes on, long hair of women, teeth of lions. He's going to send these things here to destroy you without killing you. You will wish you were dead for five months. God is going to send that on you because you like the food network more than him. He's going to send that on you because you love the travel channel. You love that which he hates. is going to melt with a fervent heat. Now, we've got to eat. We've got to go places. But exchange for the scriptures, exchange for the word of God, exchange for the will of God, exchange for his heart, exchange that, let that sit on your throne and sit to Jesus himself. You fool. Don't be a fool. Repent. That means change. Godly sorrow. Let the word of God come to you until you are absolutely sorrowful. Not sorrowful like Saul. Oh, I was so bad, David. I was wrong and you were right. Oh, I have sinned. And he was sorrowful in the moment. But tomorrow came and he's back at it. God says, godly sorrow. That's where you're sorrowful to him. Oh, God, man. That'll lead you to repentance, to life change, what he wants out of you, and it'll put you on the right road. You know, God has a perfect plan for every one of us. He has a finish line that he designed for you to finish at. And he is so good, he's helping us get there. He's a loving father. We must always be like King David and stay a little child in front of God. While David was fighting these Nephilim, these giants killing demons, he was a demon slayer. Blood slaughtered everywhere. That's why he couldn't build the temple, because he, he had shed too much blood, the Bible said. God himself told him that. You shed too much blood, I can't have you build the temple. I love the idea, let's have your son do it, a man of peace. And David did all of that. He was a big, mighty man. And when it came to him and God, he would cry out like a little child, Papa, please save me from this horrible pit. I'm in a bad place, Lord. Please save me. Please save me. And like a little child, he would cry out. And God, he said, and he heard my cry. We've got to get to the place where we're little children in front of God, not the big, bad, tough guy. God can't stand that. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And today's a day for God to remind you that he's offering his humility, his, his wonderful working alongside you. Jesus was humble. He told us to have that same mind. He wants you to be humble. He wants you to be in the other yoke with him and be exactly like he is in this side of the yoke. We are to be his spitting image, not because we're acting like it, but because his divinity, his holy character is flowing through us because we are abiding in him. We are to reflect, reflect him. Are you doing that? I encourage you to do that today. Do not live after the way of your past that brought you nothing but emptiness and, and scorn and horror. But live unto this new present that God's called you to and the future. We live by faith unto the future, knowing I'm going to stand before him as my judge. And don't walk in these lusts of food, of wine, of reveling, of partying. Uh, somebody comes to you, oh, dude, I've had a bad day. Yeah, yeah, let's go get some drinks. That just makes a bad day worse. Anybody ever have one of those happen? How about tomorrow when you wake up hungover? Oh, yesterday was such a bad day, today's worse. And then your problem's still there. How about if we go to God and say, Lord, you take care of me? See, I, I'm, I, well, you know what I'm telling you? I'm telling you the way it was when I was in excess of the Gentiles. That's how I did things. I'm here to tell you on the other side, it is far better. And you have peace in your head at night, even in the middle of your trials, knowing that God is fighting your battle for you. And you will make it out the other side. Why? Because I made it out the other side of all my other ones up to this point. We suffer, we go through tribulation, but tribulation worketh patience, worketh hope, worketh endurance. And, and hope for the next time I come along. He, he'll get me out of this one too because I brought my sword. I am prepared to suffer. It's going to happen. And the Lord is going to help me like he did last time. And David would cry out over and over. David would put himself in a mess and cry out and God would save him. Aren't you thankful for that? Even when you and I put our own selves in our own mess, he'll pull us out of that mess when we cry out to him. Aren't you thankful for that? And that's what he wants to do. But you better arm yourself with that and quit living after your own lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Get rid of this world. God is going to melt it. He hates it. Live under righteousness. Verse 4. Wherein, all your friends who do these things, they're going to think it's strange when you don't. When you quit running with them, guys, and you don't quit running with them because uh, I'm pious and I'm... You quit, you quit running with them because you know this is empty. You know it's vain. You read the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon, the wisest guy that ever lived, tried everything in life. And at the end of his old man life, he's sitting there and says, that was empty. I have nothing to show for that. 
vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And he talks about the vanity of life. I had money, I had zoos, I had castles, I had temples, I had, and he goes through the list, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, talking about life without God. A wonderful life, oh, best life now, but it was without God. And then the very last two verses, it says, now I want you to hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his word. Render his word the highest thing on the planet and do what it says by your life, by believing. This, this is the whole duty of man. Where your friends are going to think it's strange, strange when you quit doing the same stuff that they're doing, going back to the excess riot of living. They're going to speak bad about you. When you walk into the room, it's all going to get quiet because they will have been speaking about you. And you just keep doing your thing anyway. You are shining as a light. You, I'm not one of you. I was one of you. I'm not being arrogant. I just, I choose not to do these things. I choose to serve my Lord because I know there's an eternal factor. You're eternally going to hell right now. And I see that and that burdens me. You can't always tell folks that. But this is what I know in my heart. I'm thinking that. You're going to hell. I'm going to heaven. I'm living holy unto the Lord. I'm praying for you in the meantime. While they're ridiculing you, we don't ridicule back. When they're punching us, we don't punch back. We forgive. We don't despise those who despise us. We understand, we see beyond what they see. God's given us clarity in our vision, in eternal vision. And when I quit doing these things, I jump out of this empty vanity that Solomon found himself in. I say, I want out now because I want to serve the Lord now. The Lord immediately will redeem your past. All those wasted days, everything that the canker worm has eaten, that the locust has eaten up, God will replenish it immediately on your choosing him. Say, Lord God, I've wasted my life. I've done so many stupid things. I have gone into the excess riot living. I have focused on food. I have focused on booze. I have focused on life. I have focused on everything else, and I've always got to go back next Friday to replenish that stock to make it happen again. That's empty. It's vain. Lord God, please forgive my past. Heal my He'll take your entire past and make it though you saved all that. That's what salvation does. It's called redemption. Jesus bought back your entire sinful life when he died on the cross. Aren't you thankful for that doctrine? He redeemed. He, that's why he told us, redeem the time. Understand what time it is. Use every second you've got for him, not for them. And when you stop hanging out with them because they go to places you don't go, you know it's vanity, you know it's stupid, you know it's frivolous, you know it's dumb, you know it's sinful. They're going to talk about things you don't want to talk about anymore. They're going to see things you don't want to see. And you said, man, I ain't having no part of that. They're going to talk stupid about you. Verse 5. But they also got to know that they're going to give an account and so are you. Every man is going to give an account of him who's ready to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. God himself, Jesus Christ, is going to judge every human who's ever lived himself personally. He's going to judge you personally, one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano, when you're standing right there before him. He's going to bring up everything you've ever done for him. There will be an account given. There will be an account for everything you've done. You will give an account, and it will be public, and you will be eye-to-eye -eye with the holy judge of all time. You will be there. You better believe it now in this little frivolous small time called life. And you better quit focusing on that which is carnal and deadly and going to ruin you and focus on the truth. Realize that I am going to face this judge. He will judge me for everything I've done in the body, both the dead and the living. Hey, do you know dying is part of judgment? God never intended for Adam to die. But he sinned and the judgment came was death. Wherefore, as by one man, just one dude, he sinned, and when he sinned, death entered. Because death is the best friend of sin. And therefore, death passes upon all men because all have sinned. And Jesus Christ is the second Adam to give us life from that. And everybody who dies, it's just what, it's the, what you got coming. It's a temporary judgment. It's coming to all men except for the raptured crowd. There's going to be one generation who doesn't ever have to face that judgment of death. Don't you want to be part of that? Be saved today, man. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to call out a living bunch that never has to die. And we're going to face him face to face. That's everybody who's saved, who's believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all going to give an account of your life. Last night, the past 24 hours, I encourage you to go from living for your empty, silly, 
stupid, vain, ignorant, retarded self and start living for Jesus because you're going to give an account for the next 24 hours and they might as well be righteous. And pray, God, God, please, please redeem my last 24. You know when he redeems your last 24? When you mean it for your next 24. He doesn't play people oh, to cry out to God and don't ever mean it. He knows what your heart is saying before your lips ever talk. Make it the cry from your heart when you say, Lord God, help me in this. Will you please? I need your help. I don't want to be 30. I don't want to be 60. I want to be 100. Please help me with this. Please. And cry out like David, like a little baby. You must cry out. He'll come running. He'll pull you out of your horrible pit, this cycle you have found yourself in. And he will set you up on a rock because that's what he does. And he set me up on a rock which is much higher than I with a good view from here. He sets me right next to himself on his high holy plateau of Psalm 15. God wants us all there. Lord, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill with you? And then he tells us who that is. And it's the man who walks uprightly in his heart. It's the man who thinketh no evil. It's the man who doesn't hang out and just indulge himself in everything here temporary that God is going to burn up anyway. He invests his entirety in faith, in belief into that which is eternal. That tickles God to no end. Tickle him today. Please him. Because he is going to judge all those that have died before you and even you who, who are here right now who are alive. He'll judge you. We're going to face him. Both sinners and saints. Verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached to them that are dead. We preach to the, to the living before they die and they're still going to die. We preach the truth because you're going to be judged. We preach the truth because you're going to be judged. You guys know how many people I have preached to that are not dead? We're all going to die. And we preach to those who are dead, also to, to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Remember when Jesus died? His Spirit didn't. His Spirit had a mission later. Every person on planet Earth is just like that. When you die, that's sign language for death. Die, but we rolled over, dead. When you die, you don't die. You're going to immediately wake yourself up and you will be in eternal flame fire. You'll be in a holding cell of fire awaiting your eternal flame fire because you're still going to have to face the judge in about a thousand years. There's two judgments where we face God. You and I are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, those of us who are saved. And we chose him and we allowed him to plug himself into us and we began to produce his fruit. We allowed him to start his work in us. And when he started the work, he's faithful to complete it in us. And we let him do that. We will face him at the Bema seat. That is a judgment like the Olympics. Rewards. Going to reward you for the things you've done in the body. There's going to be people who get more rewards than others. And there's no reason anybody should get more rewards than you. No reason. The only reason is because of your lack of belief and faith and your selfishness and your short-sightedness and all you wanted was this life and you couldn't see past dying. You had forgotten that everybody dies. And you never thought about that one time because all you thought about was your best life now and living it up, baby. Gusto. You're a fool. Solomon said that you were a fool. He was the wisest guy that ever lived and was the biggest fool that ever lived. Know that. Other than Jesus, he had the pure wisdom from heaven. And Jamie tells us about there's two different kinds of Wisdom. There's street wise and there's heaven wise. Be heaven wise. But the wisdom that cometh from above is first pure, it's peaceable, it's easy to approach. It's without partiality and without hypocrisy. There's no games being played with it. It is pure wisdom. It is yes and it is no. It is wisdom from heaven, guys, is always eternal. For your eternal value, your eternal good, your eternal rewards. When when wisdom comes and you have a choice to make. Whether it's eternal value for the glory of God, you better say yes. That is wisdom. That's a beautiful gift that came your way. When you say no, you've said no to wisdom. you said yes to foolishness. You are a fool. You're saying no, God. The fool hath said in his heart, no, God, when wisdom comes. When Lord brings wisdom, act promptly. Act immediately. Do the right thing now. Say no when you're supposed to say no. Say yes. Don't say I'll think about it when there's something you ain't supposed to be thinking about. You say yes and no, you learn. You have yourself armed with your weapon. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not, you can't see them. They're not of this world. They are spiritual. And you better arm yourself with the things of God. And you'll find that in Ephesians 
You'll find the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. You'll find a list in Galatians chapter 5 of things to put off, to quit doing. And then we are to put on the armor. We're to do these things to God's glory. We're to obey Him. We're to say yes. We're to live in faith, to live in righteousness, to live in wisdom or not. You're going to face the judge either way. He's the judge of fools. He's the judge of wise men. Why don't we be in the category that says, well, I'm going to be a wise man. What is the wise man? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Job said the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. What is the fear of the Lord? It's not being frightened of him. Ah, it's realizing he's there and he's going to be my judge. And he's watching me right now and I'm going to face him with accountability. And so I live accordingly to that and I do all the stuff I'm supposed to do that he's leading me to do right now. That's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Until you live for God and in his presence always, you're a fool. Don't be a fool because he is the judge of fools and wise men. He's the judge of the dead and the living. He's the judge of all. Jesus Christ is going to be the judge at the Bema seat, rewarding us, the righteous who have been saved. He's going to give us our rewards, our assignments, everything that he's going to do. A thousand years later, there's going to be another judgment, and God the Father is going to be the judge of that one. And that's going to be for everybody who's going to hell who lived for this world, who lived for now, who was real religious but didn't include him in their daily activities. They're going to go to hell. They're going to face him before they go. He's going to say, oh, you wicked, wicked man. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never, ever knew you. What the difference is in heaven and hell is knowing God. Knowing that he's real. Knowing that he's savior. Knowing that he's judge. Knowing that he's going to destroy all those who oppose him. Knowing that he's going to reward all those who will follow him, even through the path of Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering. Jesus walked Via Della Rosa, and you and I have been called to walk the Via Della Rosa, the way, the path, the road of suffering. And I'm willing to give myself up, sacrifice myself for him and eternity. Are you willing to do that today? Peter's talking to a little bunch who's getting beat up, and they have a choice to make. I can, I can have the load lighten on me if I'll just quit this Jesus thing. Or the screws will be tightened if I continue in this Jesus thing. You better be willing to arm yourself with the same mind of Christ, and that's a mind of suffering. Who for the joy that was set before him, the future, eternity, he endured the cross, the suffering, and despising the shame. It's not going to be great. Oh boy, I'm suffering. You'll despise it. You'll hate it. But you'll know it's worth it when you come through each segment of suffering. And you'll be able to rejoice. You'll be able to be a testimony and share it with other people. God can do this for you. I'm nothing. I'm weak. I'm terrible. You wouldn't believe the times I quit, 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 and quit until I prayed, God, please keep me from quitting. And he did. And I want to share that with you. And you can be a witness, a testimony to people who are going through suffering. You can be a blessing to them. God's called us under that. You better arm yourself with this truth. Why? Because Satan has a baseball bat. And he's waiting for you to turn around. Because he doesn't strike from the front. He's a wimp. He's not fair. He doesn't bring a fair fight. He's waiting for you when things are going okay. And he's going to smash your head to that back and knock you down. And you're going to get rattled. You're going to get hurt. He's going to bring up your past. He's going to remind you. He's going to haunt you. He's going to destroy you. He's going to bring up thoughts. He's going to accuse you. He's going to do everything. And while you're down, you better have had enough word in you to be able to stand up and say, Wow, Lord, help me out, man. And stand up. And stand up with the Lord against the enemy. Because that's how he strikes. He is a first striker. And he'll come at you and he'll come at you hard. And you better have your heart prepared and be ready. Because there's a lot of people who don't. And when he smacks them in the head, they go, oh, I don't know if this is for me. And they bail out. That's one way to tell whether a person is a true Christian or not. True Christians will choose suffering. They choose it over sinning. That's what we just read. What have you chosen? You've chosen sin over suffering? Or have you chosen suffering over sin? Looking way beyond the now to the eternity, to God's reward, to his blessing you. I pray for you today. Be blessed. Walk in the blessing. Do not let Satan and his baseball bat take you out. He'll hit you. He'll come at you. You'll sin. You'll fall. You, you'll, I didn't see that one coming. Boom. He'll knock you down. But you be armed with the truth and eternity and the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and pleasing him and his being your judge, both of the dead and the living. And you're my judge, Lord. And help me redeem that moment. I just blew it. Redeem that moment I was down. And he'll come running and he'll save you. And he'll lift you out of your horrible pit. 
Set your feet on the rock and he will bless you, bless you, bless you. Live eternally. Live unto him. Quit living for yourself. Quit living for now. Get you off the throne. Get Satan off the throne. Get your favorite thing off the throne and make Jesus Christ your favorite thing. And place him where he belongs in the kingdom of God. You are my king. You are my God. You are my judge, Lord. And I live totally every day right now 